Hi, I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman here on True Crime MTN, and I'm here with a duet with the great Melba Pearson. Welcome back, Melba. Thanks, Dave. How you doing? I'm doing great, and, you know, it's always fun to talk true crime with you, even though some of these cases can be so morbid. I mean, here's a terrible case about a woman named Corey Richens, and I hate to mention her name first because I'd rather mention the victim's name because here we like to stand up for victims and it's Eric Richens. That was her husband who she allegedly poisoned to death. And this is a case that's received a lot of national attention because Corey Richens went on national TV to discuss a book that she wrote about handling her grief after the loss of her husband. Little did we know at the time that she's the reason allegedly why her husband died. It took what's called chutzpah, Melba, for her to do that. That's a technical legal term for right. a lot of call. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, we'll yeah, let's show a clip of that uh, so you can check out uh, how she tried to put on a brave face on TV. Author of Are You With Me? Corey Richens to share her three C's to helping kids cope with grief. And Corey, I want to start with your story. What happened in your personal life? So my husband passed away unexpectedly last year. So it's March 4th was a one year anniversary for us. And um, he was 39. It completely took us all by shock. Um, and we have three little boys, 10, nine and six. And, um, you know, we kind of, my kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we've experienced last year and you know hoping that it can kind of help other kids you know um deal with this and kind of you know find happiness some some way or another so melba do you think she was convincing not really i mean I think it's one of those things where now that we know the full story, we're looking back at her past behavior and past mannerisms with a whole new light, right? But I think that she is not going to be able to escape these charges in any way, shape, or form. I mean, now we're discovering that she tried to kill her husband a month before she was actually successful and that she tried to poison him with fentanyl. And it's just, you know, the poor guy, he just, he, he broke out in hives. He was completely freaked out. He called his friends after using his son's EpiPen and, you know, taking a ton of Benadryl, calls his friends and is like, listen, I think my wife tried to kill me. Like, I, I can't even, like Dave, I can't even process how that poor guy must have been feeling, you know, to think that the person that he loved, that he stood at the altar with and made vows to, you know, love and cherish until death do them part was literally trying to kill him and then eventually ended up being successful not even a month later. And that this first attempt happened on Valentine's Day. I mean, that's just, ooh. That's yeah, and uh, Melba, for the ben benefit of our audience, I'm going to uh, go over the timeline of this case so they can be brought to speed for those who aren't familiar with the, what happened. It's, you can date this back to June 15, 2013, when Corey and Erica Richens married. They signed a prenup at the time. Uh, they're a young couple uh, living outside of Salt Lake City, and uh, they outlined a lot of financial agreements for their marriage. And in the prenup, it said that the assets um, that Eric owned would remain in his uh, ownership if they divorced. But Corey could claim ownership of some of the assets if Eric should die uh, while the two are lawfully married. So there's your motive, by the way. It was financial. If you're wondering why she would try to kill her husband, there it is. And then between 2015 and 2017, Corey allegedly purchased at least four life insurance policies on Eric's life. And she began to have financial troubles. Now, a lot of these allegations came from Eric's sister, who then sued Corey. Um, she pointed out that Corey started stealing money from Eric to help with buying and selling houses. That's what uh, Corey was doing for her profession. She was trying to flip houses. In March 2019, according to Eric's sister, Katie, Corey opened up a bank account, a bank account without Eric's knowledge or consent, and it had a revolving line of credit and borrowed $250,000. And then in September 2020, a year later, uh, Eric learned that Corey had withdrawn $100,000 from his bank accounts and allegedly borrowed $30,000 in total on credit cards and borrowed money using, using fraudulent powers of attorney. He confronted Corey, and she promised to pay it back, but she never did. In October of 2020, Eric then 
reportedly consulted a divorce lawyer and an estate planning lawyer. He changed his will, formed a trust, placed his estate under the control of his sister, Katie, and made uh, his children a beneficiary. And essentially, he tried to Corey proof his assets. Uh, but Corey is undaunted. In January of 2022, she allegedly changed the beneficiary for his life insurance policy to herself without authorization. It was a $2 million policy. And uh, then uh, the, the, the beneficiary was supposed to be Eric's business partner. They found out about it and changed it back. Uh, and then in late January 22 is when Corey reportedly contacted her friend several times asking if she could get a prescription pain medication for an investor who had a back injury. So she got hydrocodone pills and uh, then realized that that probably wasn't gonna be strong enough. So then the next month, she reached out to the same friend and asked if she can get something stronger. What she said was some of the Michael Jackson stuff. You know what that is, Melba? That's fentanyl. And she got 15 to 20 fentanyl pills. And then you had on um, Valentine's Day, she apparently, according to the latest charge, laced a sandwich and poisoned her husband, who then had to take the EpiPen, as you mentioned, was able to survive. Uh, and then a month later, she handed him a Moscow mule laced with fentanyl, allegedly, and he died uh, poisoning. Now, her defense is going to be that, well, he was a drug user. He used the fentanyl himself. And, you know, there's only two people there that day, and one of them is dead. But the problem with that, among other issues, like the fact that she lied about uh, what's on her cell phone, she deleted text messages, she said her cell phone was locked the night of the death, and uh, it was up in her bedroom, plugged in. Now it turns out she was using it all night, and a lot of discrepancies. She also had a lover at the time. Um, so she's got a lot of issues here. Um, but the, I think the main problem is now, with the new revelation that she apparently tried to kill him a month earlier using the same type of poison that it's going to be hard for her to say, yeah, he did it on himself. He's a drug user. He wanted to take the fentanyl. Would you agree? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Because I think number one, you know, getting a testimony from his friends, from people that knew him, coworkers, you know, they're going to likely testify that he was one who went to work every day. He built his business. They'd never see him act in a manner that was consistent with somebody struggling with addiction, or they'd never seen him come to work or, you know, act in an intoxicated manner as a result of drugs or something like that. So I think that testimony is going to be critical. But the bottom line is she has 2 million reasons why she wanted her husband dead. She wanted that insurance policy. And, you know, what makes it just so even over the top just gross is the fact that she capitalized on that by writing a book about grief and basically going on a tour, a book tour, where she basically used the information from the murder she committed to make even more money. So it, it just the whole thing is just very, very, very perturbing. And again, I, I don't see a way she's going to get out from under this. I mean, defense will do yeah. what they can, but I don't see a path forward for her. Whenever we see spousal murders and that's usually the first place you look when someone dies all of a sudden. And a lot of people say, why didn't they just divorce? Like, why didn't she just divorce him? But as you said, she had 2 million reasons. This was based on a financial motive. And as I mentioned earlier, the prenup would have prevented her from getting a lot of these assets. And she was conniving. Allegedly, she was uh, changing documents, forging signatures, and she's being charged for all those financial crimes too. So it's not just murder. She's being charged with attempted murder now, for the Valentine's Day attempted poisoning, and she's also being charged with financial crimes. So I don't think she's going anywhere anytime soon. There's a lot of evidence against her, Melba. I don't know where she goes on her defense now that the attempted murder charge is pending. Yeah, because that perfectly plays into the hands of the prosecution because it's not, it's like, if at first you don't succeed, you know, try again. That's literally what happened here. That would be my closing argument. Like it basically she tried it on Valentine's day instead of bringing him chocolates and, you know, champagne, she brought him a fentanyl lace sandwich. I mean, that's, you know, that's the level of love she had for her husband. Right. And then seeing how she tried again a month later, again, with the whole purpose of getting his assets of, you know, financially benefiting herself at the expense of his life. So I don't see that there's many arguments that the defense can make, especially in light of all the financial crimes and all of that mountain of evidence, the bank records, you know, text messages, all of that coming to light. I mean, I think her goose is cooked on this one. 
Well, maybe her defense strategy will be to try to separate, sever the, the charges so that the attempted murder doesn't come in in the murder trial. They want those things separate uh, because the attempted murder really does debunk her entire defense. And you know they don't want any of the messages that he wrote uh, that saying, hey, I think my wife has tried to poison me. He actually wrote that in a text message to his friend. And of course, she's going to try to get that excluded as hearsay. And I think it is hearsay because it's being used for the truth of the matter asserted. I think more problematic for her are the other text messages. Like, I feel terrible. I need to go to the hospital. I, I feel sick. Um, and I think that's that's bad. And, and the worst is that he texted his wife saying, like, I feel sick. I, I need to go to the hospital. And her response was, oh, just take a nap. Oh, man. Oh, that's so devastating. And that will come in because it's not hearsay. It's a statement by a party opponent. So her statement, just take a nap, will come in, which is devastating. And then the messages around it. And tell me if you agree, Melba. I, as a prosecutor, would say now you have to include his messages around that text message to put it into context. You can't just put it in a vacuum saying, just take a nap. Well, what, what, what does that mean? And so in that way, I think you can get a bunch of his messages in. Still not the one, though, that where he tells his friend, I think my wife poisoned me. Uh, I mean, I would still push to try to get that, you know, key line where he says, I think my wife poisoned me from the perspective of maybe to show his state of mind or, you know, so I think there might be something we could play with on that. But I think the rule of completeness will be the key to getting all the text messages in. Because again, like you said, you can't just introduce one text message in a vacuum. You have to introduce the entire discussion so that the jury has a firm understanding, okay, this is, you know, this was what the, tra the transaction or the discussion was about. You know, this is the time frame, And then you can also see the state of mind of, you know, the both people on either side of the message. So all of that, I think, is going to be critical for the jury to have a really full picture and be able to come up with a just verdict. Yeah, I love your takes on things, Melba, because you were a former prosecutor, but you've also been an ACLU attorney. And yes. so here I am, the, pro the current prosecutor, saying, I don't know if we can get this, this text message in. And you're saying, yes, yes, we can. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, listen, you know, you've got to try. As, as you well know, we've both, you know, tried tons of cases in our careers, but sometimes you have to get creative and think outside the box, of course, within the boundaries of the law, let's be very clear, but sometimes you have to be creative in order to try to push your case forward and to get justice for the survivors. And at the same token, and the next of kin, and also do right by the defendant. You obviously don't want to do something that's unconstitutional, but sometimes we do have to get creative in order to get justice. Yeah, and as you know, Melba, as a prosecutor, the worst thing that could happen is that a case gets overturned on appeal and you have to do it over again. That puts the families through hell. And it, it's it's so frustrating. So you want to make sure that you don't introduce evidence that you don't necessarily need uh, that could jeopardize a conviction. So that's where the prosecutors will see. They got to be careful on that one text from him saying, I think my wife poisoned me. But I think the others our state of mind, present sense impression, excited utterances, you, dying declarations, perhaps. There are some, uh, there's some ways you can try to get some of this other stuff in. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, it's about getting creative within the boundaries of the law. You know? Yes. We just gave you all an evidence lesson from the hearsay class. Uh, <laughs> boy. At, at, at the bargain basement price, because we paid a dear price for that in law school. <laughs> yes, right, right. Yeah, so hopefully we'll get some likes out of that. And on that front, let's uh, just make a pitch for uh, the viewers out there. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. You know, True Crime MTN is the fastest growing true crime channel out there. And we want to get to 30,000 subscribers. So please like us, subscribe, and tell your friends. Absolutely. All right. Mel Pearson, thanks for being here today. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman, and I'll see you next time.